Good evening, all. This is Joel Moses with the Photographic Historical Society of New England. Welcome for another interesting presentation in our series. For those of you who are not already members, please consider going to our webpage www.phsne.org and looking at the membership invitation. Uh, we have seen some interesting growth in our attendance and our membership. And we welcome all of you. I am going to turn the speakership over to Dana, who will introduce our presenter for this evening. And thank you very much for taking the time to attend. Thanks, Joel. Hi, I'm Dana G. I'm the program coordinator for FISNI. Um, you may have seen a notice when you signed on that we're recording tonight. So this will be available on YouTube afterwards. And just a brief um, Zoom tour before I introduce our speaker. Um, at the bottom left, you'll see a, a mute um, and a video icon, microphone and a camera. Please stay muted during the presentation and um, we'll do questions at the end. Um, and, you know, in the event that uh, Nicole wants to, to pause, we'll do that too. So um, if you would type your questions for Nicole into the chat, which is at the bottom center, um, we'll get to those either midway or at the end, depending on how we're doing. Um, and uh, let's see, this up at the top right, uh, you can toggle between gallery view and speaker view. Um, gallery view is good for seeing everyone. Speaker view is best for the presentation. Um, so um, Nicole Hudgens is a professor of history and art history at University of Baltimore. She has published several articles on history of photography and two books. The Gender of Photography shows why and how early photographic institutions insisted on masculine values and authority and how women engaged with photography despite that dominant trend. Her first book, Hold Still, Madame, Wartime Gender and the Photography of Women in France During the Great War is an open access volume at the, in the collection of St. Andrews, uh, St. Andrews University Center for French History and Culture. You can find a link to uh, the gender of photography in the chat. And um, her new project, Alice, will be an online gathering place for photo historians, students, curators, um, aggregating photo history news and establishing resource wikis with the chat room where colleagues can meet. And she can tell you more about that at the end. So. Um, Welcome, Nicole, and it's all yours. Oh, you're still muted. Um, I thank you guys so much, Joel and Dana and Ben and Bonnie as well, who did such a nice layout of the newsletter that I got a copy of as well. Um, it's, a, it's such a pleasure to be with photo history enthusiasts on a Sunday night. Um, and even though everybody looks sort of like a postage stamp, you all look great to me. Um, I have the, the map behind me is one uh, from about 1877, I think. It's of the town where uh, Frisney is headquartered. And so you can see the Charles River going up, going from my, my head outward on, on the map. Um, but just delighted to be here. Some years ago now, historian John Tagg concluded that photography's history has no unity. It is a flickering across a field of institutional spaces. It is this field we must study, not photography as such. In following Professor Tagg's advice, my book deconstructs rather than adds to the conventional structure of photography's written and curatorial history. Specifically, it investigates how gendered behavior and concerns shape photographic institutions in the first few decades of the medium's existence. We will be looking at what became quote unquote masculine 
and what became quote unquote feminine about photography in the 19th century. So I'm gonna be talking about photography tonight, pre-1900 for the most part. I place masculinity and femininity in quotation marks in recognition of the fact that human beings construct these norms and they evolve over time. Placing them in quotation marks also helps remind us that often in the past, labeling something as feminine was to give it, in sociological parlance, a low status. I will argue that in order to create a richer, truer history of photography, we need to identify the masculine bias that distorted the early to modern period of photography's history. And to correct that imbalance, we must accord equal status to the feminine and the masculine in the early development of photography. To tell the story, I have used sources from what I will refer to as the North Atlantic world, primarily Britain, France, and the United States, to show how male and masculine domination of photography marginalized female and feminine contributions to the new medium. Understand that the book is not a generalized attack on the Victorian men who excluded women or the women who excluded themselves. On the contrary, we should admire the success with which men in the 19th century used formal associations and the accompanying press to promote photographic technology and its professions, establishing a tradition that has endured to the present day. The problem was and is a matter of imbalance. Women and some men, as I will show, time and again expressed a quote unquote feminine perspective on photography, but that perspective did not properly partner with the masculine perspective that dominated photographic discourse and display. The feminine perspective was hidden under the weight of masculine text. In comparison to previous works on women photographers, I offer a broader corrective to the imbalance of values still pre prevalent in the history of photography. Despite the impressive corpus of biographies and exhibition catalogs dedicated to the work of women photographers of all eras, the knowledge it offers has not led to real change in the format of our surveys, textbooks, or museum exhibits. Such accounts of photography's history and its many uses will be improved by correcting the historic imbalance of values, not simply by adding women's names and achievements to conventional accounts. To paraphrase anthropologist Henrietta Moore, the add women and stir method will not repair a deeply rooted bias. To correct the imbalance inherent in the structure of photography's history, I propose employing the phenomenon of gender as a useful category of analysis, as a lens with which to look at the human records of photography's past. One of the most interesting aspects of this story is how appearances can be deceiving. Male dominance of early photographic associations did not prevent a good number of women from engaging with, producing, and writing about the new technology, despite the obstacles. So if half of the book analyzes the reasons behind masculine dominance of photographic institutions, the other half looks at where women and femininity found space in the realm of Victorian photography and how they did so. And one of the most important goals of the book is to explore what the feminine in early photography may have consisted of and how we might reintegrate it into what remains a largely masculine perspective on the medium's history. To begin the rebalancing act, I ask you to bear with me, keeping an open mind to a borrowed concept that despite its distance from the realm of photography will be useful for our purpose. I have borrowed an ancient concept from Chinese philosophy and medicine to help us think about the relationship between masculine and feminine values. And uh, what I will do is share my screen at this point to show you my first slide. Everybody see the yin yang? Cool. 
in this philosophy, originating in Chinese Taoism, but appearing widely in Asian thought, the dual cosmic forces of yin and yang and the Chinese Taijitu symbol representing them are, it turns out, useful for thinking about how feminine and masculine values entered photography during its formative years and how they continue to weave their way through the world of art and creativity. They are useful for discovering how those values became imbalanced and suggestive for how we might restore a healthy balance going forward in order to create a better historical model. The 9th century BCE classic of changes, in Chinese it's called Yi Jing, asserts that the reciprocal processes of yin and yang in the universe is called the way. According to this theory, the way, Tao, is the flow of forces in the universe that produces all change. It is the play of yin, the feminine, and yang, the masculine, that allows for transformation in the body, the world, and the cosmos. Now, interestingly, at first glance, we see in the Asian sources the familiar masculine and feminine stereotypes, yang as heat, brightness, the sun, yin as coolness, darkness, the moon. However, these qualities are separated out this way in Taoist philosophy only to show that both are required for cosmic and human health. Neither the Yi Jing nor subsequent commentaries define men as yang or women as yin. Just as importantly as the image shows, all yang contains some yin and all yin contains some yang. And Taoism suggests that wisdom follows from being in touch with the structure underlying all things. So that dot of yin, black, in the yang field, white, reminds us to see the feminine and the otherwise masculine. The ever-present dot of yang, white, in the yin field, black, reminds us of the reverse. Note that cosmic balance in the symbol requires a yang and a yin field of equal size and weight. Especially useful in the Taijitu symbol is that it allows us to recognize masculine and feminine values while avoiding a Western style dichotomy, where an everything masculine must be stay neatly on one side of the balance sheet and everything feminine stay segregated on the other side. What we might think of as the enlightenment slash Victorian regime of gender expectations in the West. More importantly, the health of the world and of the human body, according to this principle, depends on the constant transformation of one into the other, the constant interplay between masculine and feminine. To repair the historiographical imbalance in photography then, a traditional Chinese physician might prescribe that we unblock the flow of yin in our historical accounts. So with that, so sort of conceptual introduction, I'm now going to move into what, what I start to say in my book about masculinity and the masculine in photography. In some ways, a chapter addressing the quote unquote masculinity of photography is unnecessary, since arguably the entire 20th century historiography of photography and into the 21st century showcase masculine preferences, desires, practices, and choices. That is not to imply that feminist criticism has not intervened, which it certainly has since the 1970s, or that fem female photographers are absent from the historical canon. Although it is true, few women populate the early era chapters of our textbooks. 19th and 20th century historical knowledge production succeeded so well in presenting masculine photography as universal photography that the sex of the knowledge producer, whether author, collector, curator, or historian, rarely affected the classical masculine point of view. Several of the canonical texts were written by a scholarly husband and wife team in that mode. So I'll talk a little about now, a little now about the yang of photography. Yang is associated with stereotypically masculine behaviors or tendencies, qualities that dovetail nicely 
with the behaviors expected of men and as described by historians. Masculine ideals, whether described in ancient Asian philosophical texts or more recent modern imperial Europe and American sources for that matter, included qualities like the following. Bold action, defending one's honor, and the strength and intellectual rigor for leadership. In common to these behaviors was a certain level of ruthlessness in the face of competition at school, on the battlefield, or in the corridors of power. In the 19th century, these behaviors were encouraged in men and discouraged in women. So I'll kind of show you uh, Corporal Cochran over here, Colonel Hugh Cochran, a, vet a veteran of the Indian mutiny. Whether in the context of Imperial France, the British Raj, or Manifest Destiny America, it seems clear that these masculine credentials were linked to empire building, not just in the sense of distant territories, but empires of knowledge as well. Here we will identify the yang of photography as flowing in those practices related to conquest in a number of senses. First and foremost, the drive to conquer the unknown and make visible. At the end of the 19th century, the American entrepreneur George Eastman, founder of Kodak, perfectly represented the yang of photography in his business philosophy, which combined the drive for conquest with a taste for risk. He vowed that, quote, manifest destiny of the Eastman Kodak Company is to be the largest manufacturer of, mo of photographic materials in the world or else go to pot, end quote. Eastman made good on his promise at a time of terrific turbulence in the American commercial environment. Where in Taoist cosmology, we link darkness and the moon to dreams, what I will later call the yin of photography, Yang's association with the sun, heat, and penetration points to the idea of photography as a medium of, quote, reality. The yang of photography encourages the belief held from the first decades of photography up to today that photogra photographic evidence presents us with an objective truth by virtue of the fact that the camera captures only what is placed before the lens. An automatic action of light, whether on chemicals or digital sensors. In 1883, H. Baden Pritchard said that, the photograph that photography therefore made the perfect copying clerk of which you can rely implicitly on, er, on, uh, upon the truth and correctness of the result, end quote. Photography, he argued, should be employed in the bureau of the statesman, the counting house of the merchant, the office of the lawyer, and the workshop of the engineer. This yang quality of truthful documentation was what led photographic images then as now to be accepted as evidence in courts of law or the court of popular opinion. The importance of visual clarity maybe brings to mind the cliche, seeing is believing, which relates to the stereotype that men rely on visual stimulation more than women especially where sex is concerned, but perhaps more broadly. The camera's optical penetration of the world, whether capturing bodies invisible to the naked eye, stars, microscopic organisms, or crystals, uh, or exposed bodies, whether ethnographic or pornographic, was therefore an important pillar of masculine photography. And here we have Henry Draper with a refractor telescope set up for photography in about 1870. Uh, and here is, you know, one of these sort of penetrative ethnographic imperialist images by Colonel Willoughby Hooper from the Madras famine in 1878. 
in the first 50 years after 1850, the dominance in the photographic press of the science of photography, its optics, physics, and chemistry, and its material technology remained pronounced, not only because practitioners were still working out how to capture and stabilize the photographic image, but also because those aspects of photography satisfied a yang drive, drive to probe, to see or render visible. Looking at early literature photography, including its earliest journals, single author manuals, exhibition reviews, and biographies, the dominance of technological experimentation, colonial exploration, topographic surveys, and industrial production emerge rapidly across the North Atlantic photographic world. A masculine pursuit of conquest, whether of nature or foreign terrain, was apparent in photographers columns, reviews, and published letters. For example, an early proponent of the medium, William Crookes, began his editorship of the Pro British Photographic Journal in 1858 by announcing that photography, a quote, faithful but somewhat capricious servant, may now no longer resist the power of human will. For Crookes and his colleagues, Photography was the most recent tool to aid in the mastery of lady nature, following a wave of invention since the 18th century that included modern navigational technology, the, the Linnaean system of taxonomic naming, and the periodic table of the elements. Added to those techniques were the century's new mechanical devices that automated tasks, hastening the Industrial Revolution, devices that included the photographic camera. Across the channel too, French, photo French photographer Auguste Belloc observed that heretofore, quote, nature was only reflected in the clouds, in the water, but now nature was subservient to our will and can be reproduced upon substances at our disposal and that with a permanency and in such reduced proportions as to enable us to form a collection, if we may use the term, of all its riches and all its treasures." End quote. The idea of subjecting nature and photography to the human will was an expression of the period's scientific optimism. Introducing Talbot's photogenic drawing process to the Royal Institution in 1839, Michael Faraday mused, quote, what man may hereafter do now that Dame Nature has become his drawing mistress, it is impossible to predict, end quote. Nevertheless, predict predictions soon rolled off the press. Early expectations of the coming of instantaneous, artificially lit, and especially color photography, accompanied innumerable chemical formulae and diagrams illustrating workers' improved exposure, development, and picture printing processes. And here we have uh, an excerpt, really a snippet from a report by Mr. Silberman on the process of photographic enlargement in 1860. So I read, you know, and I saw a lot of articles in the early photographic press that looked like this, right? A very kind of physical, chemical um, uh, look to them with diagrams. Uh, and uh, Belloc's Parisian colleague, Gustave Legray, too, demonstrated mastery over the elements as even light itself came to quote, work under the brilliant direction of M. Legray, like a diligent worker who rushes to his task with the rising of the sun. Sometimes the camera took either a female gender or a servile identity, as in the previous example. Other times photography was referred to as a goddess and photographers her votaries her, or priests. Frequently, photography was the handmaiden of science or art. All of these metaphors accompanied the photographer's use of the technology as a means of penetrating unseen realms. 
Printed articles and announcements showed that the central tenet of photographic discourse was that photographic image captures an objective, knowable reality. This axiom encouraged early journalists to predict the new medium's future social scientific uses. Quote, whether it be a means by which we can the more easily detect a prisoner or record the rapid light of a cannonball through the air. And so you have a lot of kind of published books like this from 1886, Portraits of Professional Criminals in America. In the United States, M.A. Root described how civil engineering, mining works, and military operations may profit largely from the art. Photography would indeed accompany the dredging, tunneling, and subduing of the North American continent, as you see in this William H. Jackson photograph of all the members of the Hayden Survey of Wyoming in 1870 from the U.S. Geological Survey. News from the colonial sphere, too, quickly appeared in the photographic journals. A multi-part letter entitled Photography in Algeria, for example, described not the adoption of photography by Algerians, but rather the European reporters' adventures among the, quote, uncivilized Arabs of the recently conquered French territory. Masculinity mingled with race identity in British and French photographic journals, as well as American uh, publications, which reported on the photography of Western expansion and herded Native American communities. Shortly after the mutiny in India in 1857, a letter arrived to the photographic news from the subcontinent, assuring readers that the camera did, quote, its share in recording the deeds of our brave countrymen here, I even in the battlefield. Leaving aside the technical improbability of a photographer, a photographer capturing action during dangerous fighting in India, the letter written by a British soldier told of how a camera operator happened to photograph him rescuing a British woman being abducted by two quote unquote native vagabonds. The reporter described how the soldier stabbed one India, Indian to death with his bayonet, whereupon the other Indian stabbed himself. The witnessing photographer on the scene was armed, quote, with a long sword, a six-barreled revolver, and a sharp-pointed knife about 10 inches long, unquote, conjuring the novel image of a warrior photographer prepared for manly action. In the American context, James Ryder similarly positioned the field photographer as a tough character. In following the California gold rush of 1849, the photographer, like other prospectors, had to brave an unknown route, the danger from hostile Indians, the chance of perishing from illness or starvation, he concluded. There was much heroism to be exercised. As has been shown elsewhere in the history of imperialism, a manly or macho identity was bound up with racial competition and subjugation. Masculine values in photography were not exclusive to one sex. Although there were very few female photographic reporters in the 1850s and 60s, there were women photographers who gravitated to masculine genres before 1900, especially the photography of exotic travel and exploration linked to Western notions of conquest. Anna Brassi, the English baroness who published A Voyage in the Sunbeam in 1878, uh, this was about her 11 month ocean voyage around South America to Hawaii, Tahiti and beyond was an enthusiastic photographer and an early female member of the Photographic Society of London. Likewise, uh, this is a cover of her book, Voyage of the Sunbeam, uh, whose uh, illustrations were based on photographs or uh, engraved illustrations based on photographs. And here is it a photograph I found of Baroness Bassey on the sunbeam somewhere along her route. 
Likewise, the Belgian woman, Carla Serena, published articles in the National Geographic like Tour du Monde journal in the 1880s, which featured engravings based on her photographs of the Caucasus Mountains. A little later, American photographer Septima Collis published a women's war record of Civil War camp life in 1889 with her photo illustrations and also a woman's trip to Alaska in 1890 showing an interest in war related and ethnographic photography that was by no means exclusive to men in the United States or Europe. Another example was in one of my, my favorite examples, the case of Isabella Bishop. Uh, her, her, she lived 1831 to 1904 uh, and she published many, many books on travel and she was an avid photographer and published many of her books with engravings based on her photographs, such as this one from Unbeaten Tracks in Japan in 1880, depicting two Ainu men in her book. She was also perhaps the first woman ever invited to lecture at the Royal Photographic Society in 1898. The Taoist table of the five elements and their associations show that yin and yang are not always or mainly expressed in their pure or extreme forms. Many of the quote 10,000 things that make up the world are a mixture of both. And so it is in photography, a blend of yin and yang impulses could produce the sublime as in Anna Atkins photographs of British algae, uh, which you see here from 1843, using the blue cameraless cyanotype process. Atkins cataloged all the known species of algae in the British Isles in the first scientific work employing photographic illustrations. On the one hand, Atkins project expressed the will to systematic mastery what we might consider a yang impulse, in contrast to what 19th century societies expected of leisured ladies' botanical sketching, Atkins catalog contained 12 parts and required a decade of professional discipline to complete. The role of the sense of touch here though, both in her production of the albums uh, and in the way she shared them, introduced a number of feminine elements. The delicate beauty of her blue impressions, lovely enough to frame as individual pieces of botanical art, yet sharp with detail appropriate for classroom examination. Her handwritten text legends, which you can kind of see there, and I can even kind of expand, oops, that's a little too much, the, the um, size, you can see her hand, written genus and species there. Uh, so she, you know, part of her production was kind of involved with um, tactility in the sense of touch, including intimate gifting of each copy to its recipient, showing that yin was as strong as yang in this work. So I'll just, I'll pause there for a moment um, in case anybody has a kind of a burning question that they might want to ask me now. Uh, and if not, we will plunge ahead to some of the femininity of photography. Um, but I would love to hear what your questions are or maybe what you're curious about, maybe one or two if, if necessary. Um, kind of, it kind of reminds me of my students. They're, they're kind of absorbing and processing, which is also great. Um, so we, we will just uh, soldier on. So uh, I'll kind of call this next section theatricality. Um, and the, it go, it's adopted from one of the chapters in my book um, that looks at some of these supposedly feminine traits in early photography. Um, I argued earlier tonight 
that looking at the history of photography with a different philosophical lens could help us open up what has remained blocked. The feminine values I will identify in 19th century photography may or may not appear in photography today because while gender never vanishes, it continually evolves. If we hold the concept of yin in our minds, we can also avoid the conflation of femininity with women since there were men all over the North Atlantic world who contributed to the following feminine genres and themes, just as we saw women photographers expressing yang earlier tonight. If the yang of photography is concentrated in the word conquest, a single word that might encapsulate the yin of photography is the word play, especially as applied to the theatrical playing of roles. This sense of play appeared mainly in the work of serious early amateurs. The masculinity of commercial studio photography, as discussed earlier, meant that the, the bulk of professional women's photography before 1890 conformed to an efficient semi-industrial system standardized in men's professional organizations advice literature and patent um, bureaucracies and legal apparatus, none of which took women's opinions or approaches into account. Although there were exceptions in a handful of mid-century studios, mainly it was in the play of the amateur that yin infusions of theatricality, dress up and tableau vivant established the femininity of early photography. The word theatricality has several meanings, including the formal discipline of drama, a person's flair for the dramatic, and a range of role-playing activities. Whether in its formal or informal manifestations, performing often involves costumes or what we might refer to in the postmodern world as drag. Specifically, I want to identify dress up as a key entry point into the femininity of the early photography. Art critic Marina Warner rightly observed that, quote, relate the relationship between dressing up and women's photography runs through the history of the medium from Lady Hal Warden to Joe Spence. Certainly Clementina Hal Warden's costume portraits of her daughters from the 1860s hints at the hours of, oh, this was an extra slide I had, um, just some from one of the more typical publications on British algae at the time to con kind of contrast with uh, Atkins production. Huh, let's go through these again. Um, I'm gonna close this and get to this. Yeah, it's in another folder. So here we have Hal Warden. Uh, her photographs in the Victorian Albert Museum hint at hours of intimate dress-up games in which mother's trunks of gowns, shawls, and jewelry were brought out for sessions with the camera. By whisking away all of the furniture and the Victorian bric-a-brac one is accustomed to seeing in the upper-class homes of the period, Carol Maver wrote, how Warden transformed the first floor of her South Kensington residence into a photographic studio, a private space for taking pictures of her daughters in theatrical poses. Mother and daughters could play undisturbed as long as daylight streamed through the balcony or second floor windows where she worked. Despite the prominence of dress up in photography, this relationship has been missing from standard histories of the medium, perhaps because girls play, whether with dolls or makeup or dress up, has an anthropological connotation of low status. Today, scholarly literature on the origins and function of dress up play for girls is sparse because it is, it is a developmental phenomenon assumed to be unremarkable, that is normal, by psychologists and lay observers. In social science databases, it may even be easier to find studies about boys in dress up 
wherein physicians and psychologists assure anxious parents that gender bending is perfectly healthy. In another form of the phenomenon, observers of adult cosplay have rhetorically shifted dress up from its low status as girls play to a means of creative transformation for high status adult men. In both cases, there is a problem with the feminine, i.e. incidents of male incidents of males playing dress up that causes anxiety. Recently addressing the controversy surrounding princess culture in the United States, psychologist Susan Scheftel admitted that the cult of pink at first struck her as a cultural shackle that little girls needed to be shielded from. But in observing her young daughter dressing up like princesses, she realized that it was helping the girl develop an identity that was just the opposite of weak and vulnerable. That in dressing up as the heroine of her own story, her daughter was imagining herself as a powerful woman who ruled, not as a passive figure to be rescued. Scheftel's insight is suggestive for the 19th century women I discuss, who whatever level of family, wealth, beauty, or creativity, were bound by the gendered constraints of the period. From a chimney sweeping maid named Hannah Colwick to an actual princess, the future Queen Alexandra, and several classes of women in between, playing dress up and capturing this play for the camera, gave life to desires for independence and control. Unblocking the flow of yin in our accounts of photography then will require recognizing dressing up and related forms of play as important, essential, and high status forms of human self-expression, what Federica Muzzarelli called performativity. We call uh, sorry, we will see examples of male and female photographers who infused their photographs with varying degrees of feminine theatricality. I am indebted here to Muzzarelli's 2009 study of women photographers, which grappled seriously with the femininity of photography across the lives of 12 women's photographic legacies. The theatrical element in Victoria women's stage photographs, self-portraits, and photo collage compositions is striking, and it was expressed across a range of social classes. Was women's fondness for role-playing so prevalent because the roles prescribed for them in real life were so confining? The vigilant protection of one's reputation and those of one's daughters operated as a virtual leash on women's movements and desires during the period. Dress up for young or older women allowed for play and the opportunity to perform alternative, sometimes exotic personas. And so here we have kind of a typical colored illustration in the fashion magazines of the mid 19th century. This one from the French Mode Illustre. It is possible that making images of themselves or other women in romantic roles provided a therapeutic break from the, li the lifelong performance of feminine modesty. Humility, quiet domesticity, and above all, pious obedience to father or spouse. The mandatory roles consigned to Victorian men, even with the privileges that accompanied them, may have sparked the desire for temporary escapism as well. Photography provided some amateurs with a new space for play, even escape from the restrictive rules of everyday life. Um, consider the case of Queen Alexandra, the consort of Edward VII in Britain and an avid amateur photographer. Alexandra's life was a good example of how underneath circumstances of privilege, wealth, and good looks, the individual endured a great deal of pain and humiliation. Photography for Alexandra may have served a therapeutic function, judging from the, tri the trials she faced from ill health, marriage, and motherhood. She suffered from hereditary deafness, that, wor that worsened with age, something called otosclerosis. 
childbirth that destroyed her, her health with rheumatic fever, a lame right leg that impaired her gait, the death of her eldest son, the royal heir, and the death of an infant son in 1871. Living in pain punctuated by sorrow, Alexandra also had to contend with her husband's terrible health, chronic bronchitis, skin cancer, and several heart attacks, and his flagrant infidelities. On top of those challenges were the strict protocols and constraints that governed a royal's movements all day, every day. This photograph of Alexandra by Lafayette comes from one of the princess's albums, which combined her own photographs, her drawings, handmade color decorations, and others' photographs, as here. Here she is dressed up as the French Renaissance Queen Marguerite de Valois for a ball in 1897. Queen Marguerite was a powerful and complex woman, estranged then divorced from her husband, Henry IV, following mutual infidelities. Later, she commanded a failed coup against her reigning brother and lived in exile. Unlike several of the wives of England's contemporary Henry VIII, Marguerite kept her title as queen and lived out her life as patroness of the arts and charities in Paris during her former husband's reign. Alexandra's choice showed wit and daring. Dressing up or dressing others up to play, to play heroines from literature, queens from ages past or even more provocative figures allowed women like Alexandra to escape temporarily from the expected display of meekness or submission, then prescribed for wives of whatever class station. Another camera-friendly form of theatrical play was tableau vivant, defined as a costume group or individual in a static and carefully arranged pose, usually accompanied by elaborate sets and props. Tableau vivant was popular throughout the 19th century as a theatrical genre used to illustrate mythology, famous paintings, or historical events. These stagings are originating in the pre-photographic Romantic era, or even earlier, predicted photography in the sense that the creator yearned to fix a fantasy in a stable image to make it concrete producing a unique irreplaceable experience for both participants and observers. Julia Margaret Cameron and others like Henry Peach Robinson, Oscar Rylander, and Antoine Adam and Salomon and understood that photography allowed them to recreate a world that exists only in the imagination of poets in the dreams of painters. And here we have Antoine Adam Salomon, self-portrait as a philosopher from 1870. This notion of photography as belonging to the realm of dreams rather than to reality was the yin aspect of the medium in contrast to uh, the yang of photography's power to reveal truth. Home theatrical productions without the camera were an enthusiasm among all the educa educated classes of the 19th century, Britain from the postprandial recreation of school teachers' families to the amusement of royal children. Isle of White neighbors, Julia Margaret Cameron and Alfred Tennyson were both theatrical and both families participated in Mrs. Cameron's Thatched House Theater productions on the grounds of the photographer's house. Muzzarelli likened Cameron, the photographer, to a kind of stage director, since she directed visual projects, verifying costumes and hairdos, setting up the decorations, and organizing set design. This is her um, uh, wet plate negative uh, positive of, of uh, her husband as King Lear allotting his kingdom to his daughters. It was no great leap then when Cameron applied her camera to the theatrical productions that she had already been creating in her home. 
Her stage groups and individuals exposed on wet plate negatives included mythological allegories, literary portraits, and biblical scenes in costume, informed by her firsthand knowledge of art history gained in the galleries of France and England. Camera had under, undertaken the staging work then for friendship to glorify that which she considered to be literary, genius, and for personal pleasure. Throughout the North Atlantic world, amateur theatricals and tableau vivant offered the pleasures of costuming and what was then referred to as fancy dress in common with the masquerade balls of the upper classes. In Edith Wharton's House of Mirth, for example, Lily Bart makes a sensation posing as an aristocrat from an 18th century Reynolds painting during a high society party in New York. Another Lily, Lily Langtree, before turning to the stage to earn much needed income, participated in tableau vivant at high society parties in London to rapturous applause. In 1880, at one such party, a charitable benefit, Langtree played a Walter Scott heroine in a short blue dress on a set designed by her friend, the painter John Everett Millay. Later, Langtree would use photography to help build her career and her decades long mystique. And this is one of several portraits of Lily Langtree that I talk about in my book. However amusing such diversions were, the, the theater nevertheless was not an acceptable profession. Actresses in Lily's day were seen as immodest and unladylike and often assumed to be prostitutes. Across the North Atlantic world, patriarchal society had a love-hate relationship with the theater. It loved and respected its male playwrights, but forbade its respectable daughters from becoming these geniuses interpreters. Homebound theatricals then were acceptable domestic entertainments, but embarking on a paid career in the, the in the public theater was not. Perhaps the early woman amateurs that we encounter indulged in costume tableau because this activity had the exciting aroma of illicit activity. There were several male photographers during the 19th century who also played with theatrical compositions, compositions such as Lewis Carroll, for example. Commercial photographers too had successful careers as theatrical portraitists, what we might call publicity photographers today. Talented men like Napoleon Cerrone in New York, James Lafayette in Dublin, and the Reutlingers in Paris. To name just three, photograph the best and most popular actors and actresses of their day. And I'll kind of start to finish up by lead it, leaving you with Cincinnati photographer James M. Landy, who created a series called The Seven Ages of Man, Portraits in Costume, inspired by a soliloquy in Shakespeare's As You Like It. Landy exhibited the Shakespeare's Seven Ages portfolio at the American Centennial Exhibition in 1876, the 1889 Universal Exposition in Paris, and again at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. The model for the soldier, which is pictured here, being the fourth age of man was Landy himself, and it appears he relished playing the part of the knight. Opposite the tipped in plate in the album in Shakespeare, is Shakespeare's description. Full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth, end quote. The yin of play and the yang of conquest were well blended in Landy's photography. While using play, performance, and dress up for his theatrical tableau, Landy also mass produced the images in large quantities as cabinet cards, aggressively marketing the series in the photographic press and at exhibitions for sales and prizes. Uh, so, that's what I'll leave you with today. And I would be eager and excited to 
discuss all of that with you or talk about what maybe some of the slides make you think of in your own experience. Thank you, Nicole. Um, if everyone wants to unmute and give Nicole a round of applause, that was excellent. Great job, Nicole. Thank you so much. Very well done. We do have some questions in the chat. And um, I think Ben asked about the cyanotype process and Larry sort of answered about how the pictures were made as shadowgrams. Um, talking yes, about Anna Atkins. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. Jessica Ferguson says that Anna Atkins' work is also very intimate in the way it's made. She and her friend Anna Dixon, mm -hmm. right name, work together to make cyanotype albums, another feminine way of working. Ooh, yes, thank you, Jessica. Um, yeah, I mean, the Anna Atkins is sort of my my yin yang blend for you tonight, right? Um, uh, just as sort of James Landy is kind of another yin yang blend. Um, and so absolutely, you know, she was, she was not married. Um, she was, uh, she worked with her father when she was young. She had her intimate friend. She made these amazing cyanotype albums, you know, for friends and scientists who she knew would appreciate um, the illustrations. Uh, I would agree, you know, about a, a very feminine way of working. Jessica, um, have you found that Anna Dixon assisted her in the production of the albums? Um, that's a good question. Well, first of all, she was married. Um, she married someone named Children. Oh, that's, yes, that's right. That's right. But she, um, Anna Dixon was a childhood friend, and then they collaborated. You know, it's kind of like women doing quilt making. I, th I thought it was very interesting, and they made those books together. But Anna Atkins was is a really remarkable blend. I mean, I liked your idea of the yin and yang, the scientific, because she was very precise using the Latin names. Um, but her handwriting was so organic, and using that paper, and I, I think she must have oiled the paper or waxed it to render it uh, transparent like that, translucent. I mean, really fascinating example, you know, bridging the two worlds of science and what well, she's seen as an artist now, just as Box Talbot is. Um, it is. I don't know that he was then, but you know, it's an interesting connection between them also. Yeah, and the, I mean, this comes up in uh, way back in my dissertation that, you know, the very early photographers grappling with photography is it a science? Is it an art? If it is an art, what kind of art? So that's all still being worked out during Atkinson's life. Um, yes, uh, uh, born uh, Anna Childress and uh, married Mrs. Atkins, yes. Thank you. Um, there's a, Jessica, you had another question about Julia Margaret Cameron and how does she fit in? Um, we talked about her a little bit um, especially with the, the dress up um, attributes or sort of theatrical sense of role playing in her photographs, you know, with male and female subjects like her, you know. Um, do you want to speak about that, Nicole? Is there something that you wanted to add about Julia? Um, let's see, I'm looking to see that comment is, uh, uh, where does Julia Margaret Cameron fit into this group? Yeah, I mean, so Julia Margaret Cameron, you can always count on her to, you know, to be in the textbooks. And she flickers across my book. I use her in examples of lots, lots of things. And then this chapter, you know, theatricality, um, really she's, you know, she's capturing tableau vivant that she's dreamed up in her head, you know, using children in the neighborhood, her maid, relatives, her husband, and as in the example that I showed, um, you know, whoever uh, would sort of uh, allow her to take their time and attention. Um, she also comes up in another chapter I have called Softness. I'm kind of looking and analyze the femininity of softness. And of course, much ink has been spilled over the, the fuzziness of Julia Margaret Cameron's photographs. And I talk about that in my book as well um, as certainly deliberate. 
uh, and you know why she chose to uh, express herself in that way. Let's see. Hi. Uh, yeah, um, Jeff, I see a comment in the chat and I wondered if you would go more into what you were saying. Thank you. Um, and, and thanks for uh, addressing us. Uh, I find that uh, so much of what you've said sort of overcomplicates the whole uh, problem of uh, women in, in photography. In, prior to 1880, the only way you could do photography was to be mixing your own chemicals and coating your negatives. And if you're not in a studio, you're driving around with a mobile uh, dark room. It wasn't easy for anyone. And in general, as we all know, uh, at that time, and well, unfortunately, even to modern times, there's a, uh, a stereotypical a, a pro, a view of women as being not appropriate for these sort of technical things. But that's society-wide. Mm -hmm. It's not just like, well, it's just photography. Yeah, and, I, um, I, 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 I just don't get the yin-yang thing. I mean, I, I get it in the sense of what you're trying to say. I just don't think that there's so much more to the complexities and the difficulty of photography that anyone could even do it in those days to be thinking that uh, there are, I don't think there's just feminine and masculine uh, uh, concepts uh, would make some sense if you were talking about, and, and you did to some extent, about the content of the photography. But uh, I think in, in this era, uh, the technology dominates the problems, and if anyone could even do it, take a picture, they were they were ahead of the game. Yeah, you know, I I talk about um, the early women professional and amateurs, uh, you know, uh, uh, along the chapters of my book, and to some extent try to dismantle, you know, this myth that you know the reason why women supposedly, you know, didn't take up photography was A, because it was chemistry and they couldn't do it, and B, because of the awkwardness of the equipment. What I have found is that, you know, some women became professionals and amateur photographers beginning in the 1840s, and I document them in my book. And really for those who either learns the process uh, the daguerreotype process, the wet collodion process, or the dry plate process, uh, you know, the, the, for the women who learned it or were shown it, um, you know, the difficulty of the process and the awkwardness of the, equip of the equipment didn't stop them. But to your point, Jeff, um, you know, photography, I talk about this a lot in my book, how you know, the whole notion of masculinity in the 19th century is changing. It's going from, you know, really uh, kind of medieval notions of soldiering and kingship and crusading to business and technology, um, science and achievement. So to your point, um, the kind of the chemistry, optics, physics of photography, all of those were field, fields that men of kind of a, several different classes in 19th century photography were encouraged to pursue. So, you know, it very much was, and you're absolutely right, not just photography. Um, I even, you know, in my book, I talk about the 19th century darkroom and the 19th century photographic society as a kind of laboratory of modern masculinity as middle-class men sort of redefine what it is to be manly during the industrial revolution. Uh, may I- Thank you for your response. May I point out something here? I just remembered, um, I grabbed my copy of Collier's Encyclopedia of Universal and Commercial Knowledge, the 1888 edition. And in the back, there's an article, Photography for Girls. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, it's first, par first paragraph is this. It is difficult to see why photography has not been more taken up by girls, mm -hmm. either as a recreation or a profession for it seems to be an art for which they are particularly fitted. 
They are, there are indeed few pursuits which require such rigid attention to cleanliness, delicacy of manipulation and patience. These things, which are virtues at all times, in photography become positive necessities. But girls are not generally deficient in these qualities. And those who possess the additional requisite of taste mm -hmm. may look forward at any rate to a fair success in photography. Without taste, indeed, it is a mere mechanical process incapable of producing a pleasant picture, except as the result of chance. That's yeah. great, thank you. John, that, that, uh, that article sounds very familiar to me. I may even quote from it in my book. And yeah. I, have a whole, I have a chapter, John, in the book that's called Work for Women? Question mm mark. -hmm. Right. You know, so you have spokesmen who are saying this is going to be perfect for women because they can, you know, they can have a home studio and their taste and delicate fingers will make them perfect. You know, and then there's professional studio men photographers who kind of may say that, you know, and they're trying to make the profession masculine. So they're kind of trying to scoot it away from the feminine. So I absolutely, you know, I talk about that in the heart of the book. I could jump in and just say that, you know, there was the Boston photographer, Mrs. Stewart, who had studios in Boston um, during the cabinet card era, I believe. And um, the whole Kodak girl movement of women as photographers in the early 20th century, Kodak marketed to women. Every catalog was a picture of a beautiful woman in a beautiful hat holding a box camera. Yeah, I yes. Yeah. Uh, but but Dana, way before that, yeah. Um, you know, one of the places that I performed my research was at the Beinecke Library at uh, at Yale, um, which is such a pleasure to do research in, and it contains the Peter Palmquist collection of women's photography, and that was sort of the motherload of pre nineteen hundred uh, professional women photographers all over the United States, um, you know, with the documentation about their biographical information um, and some, and including European women as well. What's, um, did he publish a, a catalog? Was there an exhibit uh, on, on that collection that there was a soft bound catalog of? I believe that there, that there is, Dana, there's several catalogs in the collection in the Beinecke Library and some, you know, some of his notes, which are not published as well, you know, which is in there, that, that was really helpful to me. Uh, let's see, Reich had a question. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm scrolling up and down here. Um, yes, um, he says that one of the great social um, documentary photographers of the 19th century, John Thompson, explored the social conditions in England and later in Asia. Um, are there any women who pursued, pursued this type of social documentation at the same time period? Like oh, nice. Yeah, so there is one. Um, and and uh, the person that I kind of always pair up with John Thompson is Isabella Bishop. She was, you know, a Victorian photographer. And the reason I pair her up with him uh, is not because of her documentation uh, in England, but because both of them went to China at around the same time. And her photographs from China in the 1870s, uh, you know, are amazing, you know, but people talk about John Thompson a lot and they hardly ever talk about Isabella Bishop who, you know, who was an amazing photographer. Um, and if you really want an amazing read this summer, read, her, read the biography of Isabella Bishop. She was a fascinating woman. And as you saw in the presentation, she took her camera to Japan, to Hawaii, um, to Colorado in the United States. You know, she went everywhere. Yeah. Um, let's see. Dana, I've got a question if I could um, fit one in while you're reading the chat. Um, Nicole, you talk about the gender of photography, and I know a lot of people think of gender as being a male or being a female, but with the gender of photography, um, to me, one of the things that drives me crazy about photography is that it was not considered an art until it seems like later in its process. And some of the early people, of course, they would try to make landscapes and everything, but so much about photography was about um, 
not necessarily crime scene uh, photographs, but things that were supposed to be objectively true. My style of photography is much more feminine because I do like to play with light. I like to take photographs that aren't for, they're not document photocopies. So can you talk a little bit more about the gender of photography in terms of not just who's taking the picture, but even why uh, like a woman might be taking and, and such? Yeah, I mean, I actually, I was just like trying to cut this down, you know, to be 45 minutes. And I, you know, I talk about that a lot and especially, you know, for students that like the difference between these dyads, right? Masculinity and femininity on the one hand and, you know, men and women on the other. So those are two separate things. And as I kind of showed in the presentation today, you know, a person of one sex could show characteristics of the other. And we see that in everyday life, right? Um, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, if you look at the theatrical, theatricality, softness, hybridity of the photography of people like Lewis Carroll, uh, of uh, Adam Solomon, um, you know, and uh, some other professional photographers that I talk about in the book. Um, you know, I talk about, you guys probably know Henry Peach Robinson's uh, classic photograph, Fading Away, which is a tableau vivant. Um, and very taking great pains with texture and tactility. Uh, there's a great sense of touch in that photograph. So yeah, um, Ben, I would absolutely uh, affirm and emphasize that, you know, that these, that these um, gender characteristics are definitely bouncing from one sex to another, depending on the personality of the photographer. Do you talk in the book about women who worked alongside men in a photography studio, like women who were assistants or who retouched photographs or who were part of the, the sort of, you know, preparation for the actual photograph to be made? Yes, um, I have a, a chapter in the book called Women in the Studio. And uh, the really, the whole section of the book talks about the different roles women had in the studio what was said about them in the photographic press. Uh, I, just, um, I just converted a chapter called The Gender of Coloring into an article for a French journal. Um, and, you know, the way photographers felt about retouching and about coloring and tinting um, and kind of very intense language and debates that they had about that. Um, and, you know, as well as women establishing and operating their own studios, you know, and how, I, lo I love talking about Hannah Maynard. Do you guys know about Hannah Maynard? She's a Canadian studio photographer who did really interesting things kind of on her time off with sort of combination print portraits and, um, and stuff like that. I talk about her. Uh, so yes, and also, um, if anybody is interested, um, you, you can go through Dana. I have a, like a flyer for a discount um, on the book, which uh, is not uh, priced cheaply by Rutledge. If anybody is interested, I can send along the flyer for that as well. Yeah, we can we can share that maybe in the next newsletter or on you know right you know alongside the the newsletter about your talk. Maybe we can add that to the website. I'll add, I'll talk to um, Reich about that. I would love to. Um, the other thing, you know, when you were talking about play, um, something that stuck in my head was Little Women and Joe creating these, you know, stage managing, writing, directing, how, um, you know, women in theater or even portraits of actresses like Charlotte Cushman or, you know, the, the women that you were talking about having portraits made and distributed as souvenirs or, you know, for sale by photography studios. Um, it seems to me that there's something very free about the way that that takes place and, and not as studied perhaps. Um, it's, it just seems more organic to me when it's coming, um, when it's, I don't know, I'm trying to say, there's a more feminine quality of sort of. Yeah, I mean, really like the word, the word for it is yin, right? 
I mean, so it's, it's the yin is the combination of all of those sort of feelings that you're talking about that are kind of hard to put in one word. So, you know, um, ancient Chinese philosophers did it for us. All right. And um, Ben, how are we doing for time? We had um, a bit more questions than, than normal this, this, this month. So I think we're getting a little bit tight on time. So I think what we could maybe do is um, uh, try to wrap up by 8.50 with the, the uh, sort of informal conversation, just give everyone a chance to say goodnight. And then um, as we hit uh, 8.50, I could um, close down the meeting if that works. Sure, did, um, did anyone want to, um, I, Jessica, you had another comment about um, Cameron and Hayward and were both prosperous photographers. Did you yes. want to add anything about that? No, I just thought it was interesting. One of the previous uh, commenters had pointed that out. So it's true. I don't know if other women had that impulse, what they would do. I mean, you know, if they wanted to draw that, maybe that was more accessible. But it's, I can't wait to read your book. It sounds wonderful. And I really appreciate everything that's been said tonight. Very thought provoking. Oh, good. Yeah, I mean, it was a combination of, you know, I talk about several women, you know, of all classes, really you kind know, of solving the problem of you know how do I set myself up with all this equipment how they solved that problem was working with you know a studio photographer that they had chemistry with right. um, you know to give the countess de Castiglione yes I, I yeah I talk about the countess at length in the book uh -huh. um, but and what's interesting is that it's also people like Hannah Colwick who was Oh, I don't. Uh, yeah, Hannah, Hannah Colwick was a uh, scullery maid, you know, the kind of, you know, the, and she had a relationship, you know, with um, Arthur Mumby. It's kind of, it's kind of an interesting story about them. But she, you know, kind of met these photographers. And so she had photographs taken of her in drag, right? Dressed as a man, dressed as a lady, dre you know, all dirty with coal dust all over her, right? Um, and then all people like Lily Langtree. And then in America, I have interesting examples like, you know, even Sojourner Truth, who very carefully composed carte de visites, portraits of herself, uh, and, you know, working with the photographer, copywriting the image for herself, and then selling them in order, you know, to earn her living while she go, went on speaking tours, right? So it was all types of people and all types of women um, with this impulse. Great, um, let me just see here. Um, I, think, I think that's all the questions that I see, unless anyone has a brief question or Nicole, if you would like to add anything. Or does, does anybody uh, would like to look at any of the slides again? In case I went past them fast. I do have a question about the, um, the yin and the yang. Um, we talked about how technical photos are kind of more on the uh, yang side. And um, like the dress up photos and the play photos are more on the uh, yin side. So things that are like theatrical count as play, humor count as play. So it seems like to me, the, the men might have had sort of, or the, the masculine photo, photo style might have had like its, its dominance during the period. But to me, looking back on them, I just love all those play photos so much more. So if you could kind of show us any of those play photos, I would love to see one. Oh, like, so let's see, any kind of other ones? Let, hmm. Let's see. Um, if I can, I don't know if I can sort of whip something out quickly. Let's see here. Um, who, uh, by the way, Ben, who are your favorites? I like the one where it showed like the, uh, the princess dressed as the queen. Um, you had that during the presentation. Oh, but I, I mean, even your personal favorite photographers, do, do you have oh, any? Oh, I'm, I'm such a, uh, equipment nerd. I, I barely even know anything about photographers. I learn so much every month, but 
Um, no, I don't really have a favorite. I'm not getting to the right file that I need to be in to, to show you more. Oh, wait a minute, here we go, let's see. Oh, so I'll show you a couple of the uh, Countess Castillon. Let's just share. Here's one of hers. So she, you know, she paired up with uh, Louis Pearson in Paris, and they kind of created these really self portraits of this one time beauty who was the mistress of Napoleon III. So she would dress up in different costumes. Uh, here she is uh, as the queen of Etruria. And, this, and here she is sort of taking flight. And this one's kind of interesting. Unfortunately, it's in grayscale, but she's, she herself has overpainted decoration you know, on top of the glass plate. That's Hannah Colwick. That's great. Yeah, so here she is dressed as a man. And this is, eight, this is 1870s. Oh, and Lily Langtree, I talk about her. Lily Langtree kind of, yeah, she paired up with Lafayette and had a lot of portraits of herself taken in her roles to promote her roles and her shows that were playing. She would be in advertisements as, as well. Um, my kind of, uh, in my tactility chapter, I talk about albums and the tactility of creating albums and sharing albums. Um, when you see President Lincoln sharing an, an album here with his son. And so here's a Fading Away by Henry P Peach Robinson that has like this great tactility quality you see all of the care with the drapery, the different checks, textures of fabrics, the curtains, you know, and also like the tableau vivant uh, composition. It was very controversial in its day. Uh, colorists, um, like this one, uh, who actually, Lilla Henny, I think was her name, and I think she worked in Massachusetts. This came from uh, the Harvard Library. And of course, and, and unfortunately, you're getting the grayscale here, but here was one of the album pages mm. uh, in one of Queen Alexandra's albums. So it is in my chapter on hybridity. She's mixed photographs with painting and drawing. Thank you, Nicole. We had uh, a presentation before we started Zoom by Edie Bressler, who is a photographer who not only works with cyanotypes, but also with mixed media co collaborative photography with the community and also stitching on the pictures themselves using thread to sort of embroider the photographs. Yeah, I, I mean, I see hybridity, just as with theatricality, Hy hybridity is a line, you know, from the origins of photography and women to the present. You know, I have a colleague at the University of Baltimore, Julie Simon, who sort of does digital photographs, but she kind of takes it in Photoshop and kind of adds splashes of color and changes the shapes. And, you know, so these sort of these adding you know, non-photographic elements, photo collage, mixing media, that's very prominent, um, that's prominently shown in my book. Well, this has been a really valuable discussion and I, I can't wait to read the book. I'm so glad that we were able to come together and um, be here for your presentation. And um, if, if you would, um, 
if people have further questions, may they contact you? Please do, yes. If you put your email address in the chat, perhaps. Yeah. That would be great. And um, then I think we're just about hitting the end of the mm -hmm. night. Um, could you let us know who next month's um, presentation will be? Well, um, Nicholas, for you. Um, next month, um, Edith uh, Courier, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, is going to talk about the Cromer collection of early French photography, I believe. So um, that will be, uh, I believe it's June 6th on Zoom. Let me look at my calendar. Great. Yes, right. six. Okay. And there will be more details in snapshots about that presentation. And um, again, if anyone um, has ideas for a presentation or knows someone they would like to present as a speaker, um, they can email me at programs at disney.org. Um, and, you know, we, um, we welcome people to join as members and, you can also view this presentation on YouTube. Uh, it will be available on, the, on our YouTube channel. If you go on YouTube and just uh, look for FISNY, um, you'll see the channel. And that has archived presentations going back from when we started about. And um, at this point, we usually open up the, um, the meeting so people can chat a little bit, uh, but I would like to give Nicole another round of applause because that was excellent. Thank you guys so Thank you, much. Nicole. Thank Great you. job. Thank you. I saw the re little review of my book in the snapshot, so you, you guys have been so lovely. Thank you for finding me, and thank you for being a lovely audience. <laughs>